Well, hello and welcome to another Friday night Bible study at Grace Baptist Church. I just want to tell you how blessed I am that we come together like this for this class. Um, I'm especially blessed because the material I'm using, we're not using at my real life church, or I should say, I don't want to say real life, my first life church. Um, we're using um, some other material for the next six weeks. So this is the only chance I get to get into my Sunday school material and teach it. So it's really kind of exciting. And today, I'm really excited about the topic, exercising financial responsibility. And as I said earlier, before we started class, that doesn't say in here, you have to give 10% to your church. It says exercise financial responsibility. And when it talks about taking care of God's money, because God, everything we have comes from God, it says to give cheerfully. If you're giving painfully, then you're not giving the right thing. So we'll, we'll get into this and we'll talk more about that. But before we get started, let's open with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you in humility and thank you for the chance to study your word. Every time I pick up the Bible, I learn something new. It's the only book that I've been able to read, not once, not twice, but many times. And it always is new and refreshing. I love the scriptures, Lord. And I thank you so much for the written word that teaches us so clearly the living word. Jesus Christ and in teaching us about Jesus Christ it teaches us how to become more Christ-like and most importantly how to listen to you so you can guide our lives and direct us in our walk we love you Lord and we thank you as we get ready to study tonight how to exercise financial responsibility in our lives let us understand these truths and take away from here something that changes us so we can help change someone else and bring them to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. For it's in your name, the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hi, Ty. Uh, Tyree is, um, is our co-captain for uh, Grace Baptist Church. And it looks like Ty and Kevin Jones. Uh, you should get a handout for the no-card hander-outer thingy should pop out any second but today we're studying in the book of Proverbs and we're studying um, fiscal responsibility fiscal responsibility my wife didn't staple my notes together I'll be lost oh I got big page numbers on them I can figure it out so uh, I just want to say welcome to everybody hello uh, Hello, recipient of grace. God bless you. Uh, Tyree, God bless you. And I always love to see you. I need to ask you when we're going to have our next concert over at House of Prayer so we can start advertising it. Because the concerts seem to be making the most money. I don't know. We, we, we need to come up with better ideas, different things to do. But the concerts are doing great because everybody loves the music. It's different music than what they hear at other concerts. And I also want to say hello to uh, um, Negley and Jacob and Sadie and my co-pastor, Michael Boyd, sitting up here in front. And then right coming in right in the back there is Tom, a regular here at the church. God bless you, Tom. When you sit down, you'll get the, uh, the new card from the new card hand or other thing or how what we abbreviate as the NCHOT that's a code word on the church council NCHOT so today's class out of the book of Proverbs is going to talk about how to exercise financial responsibility and the question that we want to answer ourselves is what guidelines do we use for managing our finances? And the biblical truth that I want to get out of this class 
is that believers apply biblical wisdom by maintaining a biblical perspective on finances. God is the source of all blessings, temporal and spiritual. All that we have and are, we owe to Him. According to scriptures, Christians should contribute of their means cheerfully, regularly, systematically, proportionately, and liberally for the advancement of the Redeemer's cause on earth. Uh, you wouldn't think it. I know House of Prayer has a budget. We have a budget here um, at uh, Grace Baptist Church. And I also have up here on the wall, I have my paycheck, everything I, I make, and then I have the amount of money that I give to the church and then the amount of money I give on top of that to other mission um, organizations. And I put that up there on this bulletin board that's right here where our computers are as a reminder that we do need to give cheerfully, regularly, and systematically for the advancement of Christ's cause on earth. We want to do what we can to help our Lord, to help Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to read you a short story here, and I want you to think about this. Um, this is kind of pretty much the reason why we want to do or give this class. And that squeaking guess that is my chair. Frank makes his living as a financial planner. He also offers a yearly financial planning seminar at his church. Some people attend the seminar because they're looking for easy tips to get out of debt in a few painless steps. Others come expecting Frank to point them to a can't miss investments that will make them rich. Inevitably, some of those attendees lose interest and stop attending when they discover that Frank's approach is to lead the group in studying what God's Word teaches about financial responsibility. Accumulating wealth has become a primary goal in the life for many people. Pursuing financial success, they make prosperity an idol in their lives. Chasing riches, they too often sacrifice relationships, forsake compassion, and surrender integrity. Whatever wealth they gain is never enough. Many people waste their lives in a futile pursuit of satisfaction through materialism. Thankfully, most of the people in Frank's seminar accept God's direction regarding finances. They understand the deceptiveness of riches and choose to honor the Lord in earning and using their financial resources. Jesus gave his followers this grave warning about the lure of wealth. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. In my life, in the last couple of years, last three years, my finances have gone up and down. I'm a disabled veteran in the United States, and as such, uh, my finances are um, not easily controlled. They, the, 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 the veteran system uh, works their own ways, their own magic, as it were. And... Uh, my wife was working as a school teacher, but we decided um, that it was better for her, and cheaper actually, to homeschool the children. So there was a time where we actually decided, and we had to, we cut cable TV. Wah! We, uh, we even um, got to the point where we cut, we cut, all, we cut everything extra out of our household budget and uh, we're uh, eating pretty frugally but enough to take care of our children and that was the most important thing but we had to cut back and in that cutting back the one thing we never cut back was what we gave God and after a period of time our finances resolved itself um, I'm getting a pretty good uh, a disability you know it's uh it's not as much as I would make if I was capable of working full time but it is a good I mean it's I'm doing good uh, my family's doing good and that's the one thing we never gave up on was what we were wanted to do 
uh, with Christ. Now, earlier in my life, some 20 years ago, I was not like that. And money was the most important thing in my life. And I got myself into debt so bad that I couldn't afford anything. And I finally was forced to declare bankruptcy. And in the process of declaring bankruptcy, I kept all my money. I didn't give any money to church. In fact, I stopped going to church altogether. And I kept all my money. It was mine because I didn't have that much. Well, I went through a lot of suffering and a lot of months and years of suffering and pain um, not having enough money. I never had enough money. But then I met my wife. We got married. Things worked out pretty good. We started going back to church. I started giving to the church comfortably and wisely. And even though we had the same amount of money, things seemed to work out better. Everything worked out more appropriately. So I think the message that I want to give out today is not you need to give 10% to your church. And I'm, I'm certainly not asking you to donate here uh, at the Second Life Church. If you need to do that, if you feel moved to do that, that's great. I am not going to deny that. It helps paying the rent. But you need to donate to your First Life Church. And you need to donate to help spread the gospel message of Christ throughout the world. Not just in Second Life, but also in First Life. Now, money plays an important role in human life. There's no question about it. The focus of this lesson is on where money or material treasure fits into the respect of other critical issues of life. Some people seem to have, as their sole purpose in life, amassing such material wealth as possible. Money has become their master or idol, and they neglect weightier matters, including God and family. The scriptures give us God's wisdom regarding the place and use of money. Now, this first section, because it's so many verses, actually all of them, I'm going to go ahead and break it down instead of read them all, you know, read them different parts. So I would like if somebody can read for me what we're talking about, placing finances in perspective, if you can read for me 1616, where it starts on the note card, Get Wisdom. Okay, well then I'll read. But I want everyone else to get ready to read the next one. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read 1616 where it starts with Get Wisdom. Get wisdom, how much better it is than gold. And get understanding, it is preferable to silver. Wisdom is a God-given commodity that is rarer than gold and more precious than silver. Most nations of the world have at one time or the other based their currencies on these precious metals. Yet the value of gold and silver can fluctuate too, and their stockpiles are limited. In contrast, the storehouse of God's wisdom is unlimited. The understanding of God does, that God desires to give his people never loses its value. Knowing how to use wisely the dollars one possesses is always better than having more dollars just to waste foolishly. Can someone read for me the next section starting uh, 22 verses 1 and 2? Proverbs 22 verses 1 and 2, please. How about you, Michael? Can you do that? Sorry, Brian. <laughs> what am I doing? Uh, Proverbs 22? Yes, sir, please. 22 verse 1, right? Go ahead with 1 and 2. Do that little paragraph. A good name is to be chosen over great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. 
The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord made them both. Sorry about that. I My computer decided to lag on me. In chapter 22, verse 1, we see likewise a good name, that is, a reputation characterized by honesty, trustworthiness, kindness, and the like, is more valuable than silver and gold. No one can buy true respect or favor. A good reputation means that people value us for our godly character, not merely for what we possess. In God's eyes, the rich and the poor are the same. Remember that. Keep that in mind. The richest man in the world is no, no more important to God than the poorest man in the world. They are all sinners. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. Rich and poor were included in God's plan of redemption in Jesus Christ. God shows no favorites, and he's not impressed by how much money is in a person's bank account. All of us are accountable for what God has placed in our hands, whether material or spiritual. You know, this reminds me of something, and it's totally off the subject, but I want to get this out, and I want you guys to understand this. I was asked today by somebody if it was okay for them to be friends with an unrepentant sinner. And I'm not going to go into their sin um, and, and, and what the problem was, but they really liked this person as, as a friend, nothing more than a friend. They really liked this person as a friend, uh, but this friend lives in such a way as that they're sinning. I mean, they're, uh, they're an unrepentant sinner. You know, it could be an alcoholic, a drug user, you know, anything like that. And my answer was, of course you can be friends with them. Jesus Christ called Matthew, a tax collector, a Jewish tax collector, to be one of his followers, one of his disciples. Probably the worst of all uh, people that they would, could you possibly call, but Jesus called him. So of course it's all right to be friends with sinners because we are all sinners saved by grace. And whether rich or poor, God loves us all equally. Can someone read for me the next section, um, Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5? Don't wear yourself out to get rich. Stop giving your attention to it. As soon as your eyes fly to it, it disappears, for it makes wings for itself and flies like an eagle to the sky. Here, Solomon contrasted the return on investment of two different people motivated. Wait a minute, I skipped something. I did. All right. People can easily find themselves falling into workaholic habits when their primary goal is to gain riches. They neglect family, health, and other more important aspects of life because their attention is riveted on making more money. When, can, when we care more about gaining or spending money or accumulating possessions than we do about our families, we can end up losing both. One of the dangers for a person obsessed with getting rich is the fleeting nature of wealth. Notice Solomon's play on words in 23.5. When our eyes fly to riches, wealth off, often makes wings for itself and like an eagle flies out of reach. Dynamic losses in the values of stocks, homes, and other investments demonstrate how quickly money can vanish. One reason why Grace Baptist Church exists on this parcel is because I can afford it. It's in my budget. It's in my annual budget. And it's something that I'm willing to pay for um, over the course of a year. Uh, if I get donations, and by the way, I've been blessed with donations for, from, from all of you here 
and uh, we're paid out until the end of August now, which is why we're taking Relay for Life donations instead. Uh, but we've been blessed beyond measure with donations for this parcel. But the reason I keep it the size that it is, is because I can afford it myself. And we can still put 100 people in here if we ever get that many. They'll, they'll have to sit on the carpet. Uh, but I don't have to pay that much in order to maintain this parcel, this little piece of land. So you, you don't want to get so invested and so um, seriously involved in get acquiring wealth and acquiring other things. Perhaps one day when the church gets bigger and gets more uh, of a foundation like House of Prayer, we'll have three sims or four sims like House of Prayer has. But now this one small parcel is plenty for us because this is what we can afford and this is what we know about. I'm going to go ahead and read this last verse or the next section, Proverbs 28 verse 20. Proverbs 28 verse 20. A faithful man will get many blessings, but one in a hurry to get rich will not go unpunished. A faithful man will get many blessings, but one in a hurry to get rich will not go unpunished. Here Solomon is contrasting return on the return on investment of two different people motivated by two approaches in life. The faithful person trusts in the Lord, embraces God's wisdom, and lives according to God's promises. This person's investment will yield many true blessings. By contrast, the second person is driven inward by an overwhelming desire to get rich quick. That person's investment will yield various punishments. This is not to say that all means of gaining wealth are sinful. However, the warning associated with this proverb relates to a lifestyle of selfish greed. Scripture constantly warns us that God condemns such a lifestyle. Now, I want to emphasize that it's okay to work to get money. In fact, that's what God called us to do. The sixth commandment, I'm sorry, the fourth commandment is the one that is most oftenly misquoted. Not only does it say that uh, to uh, to honor and worship on the Sabbath, but it says to work hard the six other days. We are to work for our living. God told Adam and Eve to work for their living. Um, when Adam and Eve were first created before the fall, they were created in order to take care of the garden and work. So there's nothing wrong with work. But work wisely and not only do you take care of your family, but take care of God and God's work at the same time. There's nothing wrong with making money. There's nothing wrong with investing. Nothing wrong with investing wisely. But don't be selfish and, and in need of money quick, quick, quick. And like Michael said, wealth is not sinful, just coveting it is. And my wife says, money is not evil. The love of money is evil. And both are exactly correct. I'd like to see if someone can read for me the section we have out of Proverbs 30, verses 7, 8. I'm sorry. Yeah, 7, 8, 9. Proverbs 30, 7, 8, 9. Don't jump on it. It might bite you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Two things I ask of you. Two things I ask of you. Don't deny them to me before I die. Keep falsehood and deceitful words far from me. Give me neither poverty nor wealth. Feed me with the food I need. Otherwise I might have too much and deny you saying who is the Lord. Or might have nothing and steal profaning the name of my God. These verses are drawn from a section of Proverbs attributed to Agur son of Jekith. 
Agur made two requests to the Lord, and the two things give insight into the man's character. First, he asked that God would keep him from becoming a person of lies and deceit. And the second, Agur asked him to give him a balanced life characterized by neither poverty or riches. Instead, he confessed the desire simply to trust the Lord for his daily food. In praying this way, Augur first affirmed that God was a source of provision, and as believers, we are worked diligently in earning our living while we confess that our jobs, our ability to earn money, and all our blessings are gifts from the Lord. Second, Agur believed God would take care of his needs. This proverb does not promise wealth and prosperity, but rather affirms faith in God and in provincial goodness. And third, and finally, Agur understood the priority of his needs. The wise believer knows that a right relationship with the Lord and eternal need is more important than full cupboards, cupboards an earthly need. The temptation of too much wealth can easily lead to denying one's need for God. The temptation of poverty is that it can lead a person to think God doesn't care and his commands don't apply. In other words, a believer with nothing might choose to steal. And in doing so, a believer would not only break the law, but more significantly, dishonor God's name. Augur acknowledged his sinful frailty and pleaded for God to keep him from both of these temptations. And Michael's also right to hear, if we have too much, we stop depending on God and rely on the wealth. Although there are some very wealthy believers that are, are very strong in the Christian faith, uh, noticeably some duck hunter friends of ours, but uh, having wealth doesn't make you any better than someone that doesn't have wealth. God not only cares about how we manage our resources, but he also cares about how we acquire those resources. Living by God's wisdom involves working diligently to earn money with integrity. And that's the title of the next section, Earn Money with Integrity. Now I am going to go ahead, because this is long and I want to, there's each little short tidbits of, of information, I'm going to go ahead and read this section myself. Proverbs 13.11 Wealth obtained by fraud will dwindle. But whoever earns it through labor will multiply it. Well, I think that pretty much answers itself. We can see what, what is being said. If you lie and cheat, your wealth is going to wither away. But if you earn it by labor, if you earn it trustworthy, if through trustworthy and faithfulness, God will multiply it. 1527, the one who profits dishonestly troubles his household. But the one who hates bribes will live. In this proverb, take note of the two contrasts between the foolish and the wise regarding the gaining money. The first contrast is one of character. And then the second, well, they're, they're, both, they're both talking about the character of the person. One who dishonestly troubles his household um, one who profits dishonestly troubles his household, but the one who hates bribes lives. In 2017, food gained by fraud is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth is full of gravel. In this proverb, Solomon reveals why a person might be tempted to do business dishonestly. For some, the idea of obtaining wealth craftily by deceitful means holds a certain allure. It sounds kind of nice. And while the enterprise may taste sweet at first, eventually it will offer the same thrill as choking on a mouthful of gravel. Shady practices like corrupt hearts begin with sinful enticement but lead to heartache and destruction. 21.6 is the same thing. Making a fortune through a lying tongue 
is a vanishing mist of pursuit of death. Again, Solomon is comparing um, gaining fortune with a lying tongue to a dense morning fog that evaporates under the sun's glare. Dishonest people may think they've discovered the road to the easy street, but they eventually discover that they've been running a breakneck pace in pursuit of death. God's judgment is certain for those who take advantage of others. Sometimes it may not seem like that. It may not seem like that to us. We look at these wealthy people and we think, wow, they've got all this cool stuff. But if you examine their hearts and examine who they are, you'll see that they're really not as happy as you might think they are. Twenty-two sixteen, oppressing the poor to enrich oneself and giving to the rich both leave only to poverty. Instead of working honestly, some people take advantage of those least able to fend for themselves. Scripture constantly defends the poor against oppression. The twenty-eight six, better a poor man who lives with integrity than a rich man who distorts right and wrong. In God's wisdom, poor people are not mortally better because they're poor. Likewise, the rich are not wicked merely because they have wealth. The difference lies in the state of the person's heart. That is in one's relationship with God. A right relationship with God is evidenced by living with integrity, whether one is rich or poor. Conversely, those who cheat others and do business by distorting right and wrong give evidence that they do not know God. Whoever increases his wealth through excessive interest collects it for one is kind to the poor. And then we go on in Proverbs 28 to 24. The one who robs his father or mother says that's no sin. Is a com he is a companion to one who destroys. In verse 8, the modern term loan shark describes someone who charges excessive interest on people who cannot borrow money through normal means. Such a person will not enjoy ill-gotten gain. The ultimate beneficiaries of God's blessings are those who are kind to the poor. And then in verse 24, we finish this section out. Remarkably, instead of working to provide for their needs, some people actually chose, choose to defraud their own parents. Their wickedness goes so far as to deny that they have sinned. This proverb reminds us of Jesus' warning to people who misuse parents financially and excuse themselves with religious oaths. God's judgment inevitably falls with sure retribution on every person who uses sinful means for personal gain. On the other hand, God blesses believers who demonstrate their faith in daily life by earning their living with integrity. Feel free to type this. I'm going to ask you a question. But what principles about earning a living did you learn from your parents? And I want to stick on this idea that people will steal from their parents. I've seen all too often parents moving in, as you say, you know, quote, quote, moving in with their family and uh, then selling their house and all the money from selling their house goes to rent or some other way of paying for the kids uh, bills or something like that. Uh, but what have you learned in the value of money or the value of living well from your parents? That's a good one, Random, or Ontanka. Find something you're good at and make it your profession. I liked what he said. And then my 
uh, my wife Renee, uh, her dad always made very little money and she learned from her mom how to stretch money to feed the family, which we've had to do in these past few years. But now we've been blessed and we're, we're doing well financially. We still stretch money. We don't go to the most expensive grocery store, uh, but things are working out. I think Jacob is typing something here. And then Jacob says that his parents taught him to live within your means and earn it. And you'll always legitimately have means to live within your means. I was taught this, and I don't live it well. But I, one can only pray that for, for with this class and with the strength of Scripture, you can learn, as we all do, to live it better. Because I certainly don't live it well. There's times when I just want, I want something. There's signs that I just want something, and I buy it. And uh, sometimes we really can't afford it. So uh, I try to balance what I want to buy uh, with my wife, and if she says it's okay, then I buy it. If she says we really need to wait until next month or we really need to save up for that, then I save up for it. So I kind of bounce things off my wife to learn um, how to better maintain my funds. My parents really didn't teach me a lot about how to uh, deal with my resources. And that is the last section. The last section that we're going to study tonight is titled, Honor the Lord with Your Resources. Honor the Lord with Your Resources. And I'm going to invite my wife to read the first section out of Proverbs 3, Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Go ahead and talk. You, you, they Honor can. the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with the new wine. That word, you came out. My voice suddenly changed. I don't know why your microphone's not working right now, but it could be a million things. Um, but my voice suddenly changed there. That was kind of cool. Now, the ultimate purpose of life, including our money management, is to honor the Lord. Christians should approach material resources differently from unbelievers. Our goal is to honor Christ in every way. While some Christians might think of tithing, that is giving a percentage of one's income to the Lord's work as a pinnacle of spiritual maturity, Others believers, other believers consider tithing, that is given 10%, as similar to the Old Testament offering of first fruits. The Israelites were instructed to give an offering to the Lord's sanctuary consisting of the first and best of the crops. The emphasis was on honoring the Lord with one best, not with leftovers. In verse 10, God blesses his children who trust and obey and honor him. This proverb does not make a blanket promise of prosperity to people who tithe and give offerings. The reference to full barns and overflowing vats of vines represents the surpassing blessings God gives his obedient people. The Apostle Paul later reminded believers that God is able to bless us exceedingly abundantly above all that we think. When we honor the Lord with our possessions, He blesses us in each area of our needs. There's my squeaky chair again, sorry. God is not looking for 10% of mandatory amount of money to your First Life Church. God is looking for you to give joyfully the first fruits of your labor to your First Life Church. And whatever you can beyond that to whatever type of ministry you want to help support. But he wants you to give with a joyful heart. He wants you to give willingly. 
He doesn't want you to give because you have to, because you're forced to, because he's, oh, I, it's another bill I have to pay. It shouldn't be a bill. It should be a blessing. Give what he wants you to give is exactly how Michael states it. In verse 10, God blesses his children who trust and honor him. Now, like I said, it doesn't make a, a, a promise that we're going to be blessed just because we tithe and just because we give us, uh, offerings. Um, it's just the Apostle Paul later reminded believers that God is able to bless us exceedingly above all that we ask and think. When we honor the Lord with our possessions, he blesses us in each area of our needs. And who better to know our needs than God himself? Yeah, being blessed does not mean you will get possessions, is what Michael said. And that's exactly right. Being blessed doesn't mean you get possession. Being blessed means that you're joy, you have joy and contentment in the life that you have now. Now, moving on down here to Proverbs 11, verse 28, it says, Anyone trusting in his riches will fail, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. When we believe, who we believe in is as important as what we believe. Some people demonstrate their lack of faith in God and his goodness by trying to amass riches. They trust in their bank accounts more than in God. This doesn't mean Christians should not save money or have investments. Don't let me say that's wrong. The key issue is on focus and faith. Anyone trusting in money instead of God will ultimately fall. Conversely, the righteous who have entered in a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ... God responds to their faith and faithfulness by enabling them to flourish and thrive. Blessings don't mean necessarily possessions, but blessings mean, means that we will have the capability to help reach others with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And finally, the Proverbs 16, verse 8 Better a little with righteousness than a great income with injustice. Having a right relationship with God is more important than anything else in life. Individuals may achieve great wealth through unjust means, but that wealth will never meet their deepest need for eternal life. Without a right relationship with God, every pleasure the world offers is hollow and transitory. At the other end of the spectrum, some people who lack enough food, shelter, or other basic needs may feel God does not care about them. We just talked about that. However, many believers have experienced poverty and yet maintain their faith in the Lord. They do not accept the empty promises of the so-called health and wealth gospel. Instead, they know that if one has received God's righteousness in Christ, even a little in a way of material possessions is more than enough. The starting point for financial responsibility is honoring the Lord with everything. Then we will find ways to express godly integrity in the way we earn and manage our income so that our Lord Jesus Christ might come to have the first place in everything. There is a man, a very active member of our church. He's an active member of the Celebrate Recovery Ministry at our church. And um, I can only say this because he made it public. He, he talked about this in public. But the, one night he was homeless. He had nothing. The only thing he had was a 38 caliber pistol with six bullets in it. And he took that pistol and he put it up to his head and he pulled the trigger. And nothing happened. And he pulled the trigger again and nothing happened. And then in anger he pointed it at the ground and he pulled the trigger six times and six shots fired off into the ground. The next day, still homeless, he was met by one of the pastors at our church. Actually, our youth pastor, right? Our youth pastor met him, 
Um, I don't know the whole story of how they got together or how he met, but our youth pastor got t talking about him, about Christ. And this man was a believer, but he had kind of more or less lost his way. So he invited this man to come to celebrate recovery and, and come to the ministry that we have running at, at my First Life Church. And he did. He came. And through time, he got better. He found a, got himself a place to live. We helped him get a place to live. He got a job. And now, some two years later, he is a, a strong and useful member in the word in God's economy. Just because you have nothing doesn't mean that God hates you. God still loves you, and God will use you as his tool to do something to help bring others to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And God is using this man now as a leader in Celebrate Recovery to help people cure their hurts and hang-ups or drug addicts, alcohol addictions, um, just plain old problems, depression. He's helping them with that. And he's become a real powerful member in Celebrate Recovery because God knew that he could use them and he was willing to be used by God. Any comments? Oh, um... Morgan said started a Barnabas program at their church, which is good. Outstanding. Outstanding. And, and those are all good programs. We need to learn how to help people that need help. Unfortunately, we have to be careful because the beggar that comes to you on the street, if you give him money, he is usually using that money to go buy alcohol or drugs. What I've done more than once is I've said to that beggar when I stopped on the street, I said, well, do you want, you want food? You're standing out in front of Wendy's. Let's go inside Wendy's and I'll buy you something. And they'll go. They'll go. I'll buy them a hamburger. I'll say, God bless you and go home. And they're happy because now they have food. So I, I, I've i helped them out. And I feel good about that when I do that. We need, and like Michael says, we have to watch so we um, we give to the real needs and not just their wa their their wants. But with all that, we've talked about how to live life fiscally responsible, how to live life um, the way God wants us to live life by turning everything we have over to Him and letting Him control our needs, take care of our needs, and control our finances. I'm going to wait for Jacob. He's typing something, and then I'm going to close in prayer. Monica, a random, uh, typed out exactly right. Uh, the issue of need versus want is a really, really big deal. Oh, Mickey D. <laughs> uh, oh, no, Wendy's. Wendy's is good. It's all, They're both good food. They're not healthy food, but they're healthy. I love it. I love it. It's great food. Let us pray. My best food comes from Mama Renee's kitchen. My best food comes from Mama Renee's kitchen. There you go. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for allowing us to come together once again and explore the Bible. Study your word um, amongst fellow believers to help strengthen us and guide us in our walk so that we can take what we learn here to glorify you in such a manner as we can help reach others with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. This church, as all the churches, all the real churches here in Second Life, are here with a singular purpose 
to bring the gospel into this dark world. And if we just sit around in our Bible studies and our, our church services and we never get out and talk to people, then we're making a mistake. I pray, Lord, that what we learn here today, we can help take with us to incorporate into our real lives, our first lives, and we can work in our second lives teaching others the gospel message of Jesus and how Jesus loves them so much that he'll take care of them even when they seem to have nothing. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all that you've done for us, and you continue to bless us. For it's in your name, the name of Jesus Christ, we make this petition in our prayer. Amen. Thank you all for coming, and God bless.